everybody, and welcome to Screen Wipe, a programme all about television. I'm Charlie Brooker, except I'm not, obviously. I'm Charlie Brooker, and I'll be your host for this short series, which basically consists of reviews of other TV programmes, features about the ghastly backside of television, and loads of other stuff which should hopefully prove just entertaining enough to stop you slashing your own throat open with a bit of old tin. Actually, that's our mission statement. Now, being a judgmental nincompoop, you've probably already decided whether you actually like me or not, even though I've only been on screen for 25 seconds. Of course, I haven't exactly helped things by calling you a nincompoop, uh, acting the smart-ass with that clapperboard there, and generally being a bit bloated and weird-looking. In fact, I'm probably well on my way to being the worst TV presenter you've ever seen. But then, what exactly is a TV presenter anyway, huh? TV presenters are basically imaginary friends and they come in four main types, the first of which is the chummy neighbour. Morning to you coming up on the show today. Get your man all hot under... This is a non-threatening, cheery sort of person, often spotted during the daytime schedule, providing solace to the shattered and housebound. They smile a lot, they maintain eye contact and unlike real people, they seem to genuinely like you. Of course, that's an illusion. Why would they like you? They don't even know you. You could be sitting around jetting heroin into your eyeball, defacing a library book and drowning a kitten in a bucket for all Lorraine Kelly knows. She's still going to smile at you. Yes, it's obvious, but it's also incredibly easy to forget that no matter how hard they grin, no one on TV cares whether you live or die. As far as they're concerned, you're less significant than a smudge on a bathroom tile or, I don't know, half a sponge finger. Presenter type number two... Of the expert. Experts range from the erudite lecturer you wish you'd had at school to the approachable goon who knows shitloads about potatoes. And put them in their new home. One of the best TV experts ever was Dr Jacob Bronowski, who wrote and presented The Ascent of Man. Just watch how he delivers this next sequence. And from that moment, I was totally committed to thinking about what makes man what he is. In the scientific work that I've done since then, the literature that I've written, and in these programmes. It's like being cuddled by your granddad, isn't it? In a good way, I mean. He's simply overjoyed to be just telling you stuff, and he does so with a warm, quiet dignity. Exact and beautiful adaptation. For a measure of just how dignified Bronowski is, let's compare him with comedy youth presenter Justin Lee Collins. This is Lee Collins. I'm Justin Lee Collins, and my love is bigger than the ocean. Fuck on. And this is Bronowski. There are only six or seven essentially distinct skulls. Lee Collins. Gary Rhodes is spotted there. <laughs> Bronowski. Which is almost indistinguishable from the foot of modern man. I'm Lee so Collins. Bronowski. A searchlight into the history of man. One day someone's going to make a great road movie in which those two have to, I don't know, drive a van across Germany. Or at least they would if Bronowski wasn't dead and if Lee Collins was vaguely tolerable. In at number three, vapid eye candy. The sort of person you could be forgiven for thinking is only on the box because they look sort of nice. Uh, so. Prices seem to, prices seem to, pr- Can I just get in my hair? Can I just get in my hair? We can. Hello, Kelly Brown. Oh! Yeah. Ah, oh, lovely. But being a pretty televised puppet has to be the least meaningful job in the universe. Even the average toilet attendant does more to further the cause of mankind. Despite this, they're some of the most celebrated people in the country. It's like the world's gone mad! What's the smallest part of your own body you'd be prepared to cut off to win a picnic with Kate Thornton? Or beat me by arm. My little toe. Ah, probably my ears. My little finger. I think I'd have to um, give that picnic a miss. Finally, presenter type four, the vaguely ironic cheerleader. Well, well, Check them out. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to Friday Night with Jonathan Ross. No, they get upset if you call them monkeys. Knowing, witty, relaxed, urbane, just the sort of person you can imagine holding court at a dinner party. Go on, admit it. You'd love to be busy mates with them, wouldn't you? Hey, wouldn't you? Hey! Well, don't let your mind waste its breath. They're just a more sophisticated version of our first presenter type, the chummy neighbour. That's all. You fell for it. So, which kind of presenter am I going to be? Well, hopefully an all-new one, the incompetent, obnoxious misanthrope. 
or the bloated smart ass, depending on how you look at it. Hmm? I thought it was a dormio then, no? It is a part. Oh, these things freak me out. But you, you can't mix puppets and real food. It just it doesn't go. But there's more chunks on the display than shh, papa. I mean, what have they got? Internal organs made of felt or something? Don't worry. When it tastes this. Oh, oh, it just makes me feel ill. Oh, no, I am not a boarding person at the best of times. Uh, I can remember the worst start I ever had to the day was when my doorbell rang at seven o'clock in the morning. I opened it, and there, standing in the doorway, was a tramp with a can of petrol in one hand and his penis in the other. But even that doesn't compare to the early morning horror that is the Jeremy Kyle show on ICV1. Life-changing results. That's the Jeremy Carl Show. Next. Typically cheery start of the show there, although it's not really fair to call it a show because it's more of a it's more of a distinguished public forum for civilized debate. Sorry, did I say civilized debate? Because what I actually meant to say was it's a non-stop bellowing festival in which a cast of people who resemble sort of aquatic livestock chart the outer limits of incomprehension. Yes, I am fine with you. The ugliest thing I've ever seen, I won't touch you for bath pole. Anyway, so far, so Trisha. But the show's unique selling point is Jeremy himself, a man who's prepared to get far more stuck in than other less ominous talk show hosts might dare. I am not having language like that, and you both go off if it continues. That is the rule, OK? End of. Yeah, none of that. None of... Mm-mm. You listen to Jeremy. You listen good. Read that. On national... Te- you read it. Yeah, go on, read it. I want you to read it. No, I don't want to read it. I read want you it. to read it out. No, you read no, it out. No, you read it. And then I want you to do a little bloody jig, OK? Woohoo! look at me. Sometimes he's good cop. This is a brave lady. Marina on the show, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes he's bad cop. Do you honestly, do, do, you amoeba spent? of a man, the only do you time... honestly believe that that is the right way to behave? Seriously. Answer me. Sometimes he's evangelical cop. They love you and she loves you and you want to buy into that because that is love and it is loyalty and it is concern and you want to use that and channel it to do something about your life because you can beat this, don't you think, ladies and gentlemen? And sometimes he's, well, he he's a bit like this. Can you do me a favour? Yeah. Take those glasses off a minute. Okay. You're too beautiful. So traumatised and beautiful. You know what? Too intelligent and far too sweet for that, isn't it? Right? Let's it cry on me. Go further, sweetheart. I think you're beautiful. Oh, cry on it. Old enough to be your dad, sadly. Oh, f- cry on it, bitch. I, I don't mean that as it sounds. Mm, you're so beautiful. Oh. But at least you can never accuse Jeremy Kyle of needlessly staring things up. You must be mightily glad you're not in this relationship anymore. Oh, I'm glad, mate. Why'd you sleep with him three weeks ago, then? There's a word for people like Jeremy Kyle. Sinister. I'm not saying Jeremy Kyle is Satan. I'm just saying you could easily cast him as Satan, especially if you wanted to save money on special effects. The world and his dog has been banging on about Lost. Oh, it's so mysterious! No, it isn't. It's arbitrary nonsense. If you're after a far superior US TV series, here's a few I recommend so hard it hurts. First, The Shield, which shows regularly on 5 and is available on DVD. It charts the ups and downs in a fictional LA borough perpetually on the brink of disaster. The central character is Vic Mackey, a sort of good cop, bad cop rolled into one. He's played by Michael Chiklis, who looks so much like Ross Kemp, it's embarrassing, although fortunately he can act. Okay, thanks, fellas. Then there's The Wire on FX and also available on DVD. I don't have time to detail just how brilliant this is, but it's possibly the finest TV series ever made, better even than The Sopranos, for instance. Thrilling, tragic, shocking and almost obscenely absorbing. It takes a couple of episodes to get into, but once you're in, you are in. Buy the box sets, watch it from the start and you are in for a treat. Yippee! Finally, Deadwood, which airs on Sky and is also out on DVD. Another series so good it's downright humiliating, featuring a fantastic performance from erstwhile lovejoy Ian McShane. I need to fuck something. Trixie! I simply can't stress enough how good all three of these shows are. Make a note, The Shield, The Wire and Deadwood. Just get them. 
Richard Dreyfus and Danny DeVito star in our late film, Ten Men in an Hour, here on BBC One after question time. <laughs> Good evening, and uh, welcome to Croydon. Television costs money. So much money, it would make your head spin around. Even a programme like this, which is low budget in telly terms, costs around £47,667 per episode. £47,667 per episode. Well, it does. Oh. And stop interrupting me. Sorry. Still, 47 grand, eh? Just imagine what you could do with that. It's not enough to do something sensible with, but it's enough to do something silly with. Oh, car. Clothes. <laughs> Definitely give some money to charity. Pay off my debt. Clothes. Book a nice holiday. Girlish country. We should probably have just let them have it, to be honest. Anyway, outside the world of telly, that figure might seem astronomically high. So how does it break down? Well, even this sequence, in which all that's happening is I'm talking to you, this costs more than you might think. Uh, for starters, there's the camera guy. He's hired, together with all his equipment, from a facilities house. Furthermore, he's shooting on DigiBeta, because it looks nicer than this. This is DV, which is cheaper and simpler to operate, but looks a bit bleary and grim by comparison. Oh, that's better. Anyway, the camera guy, the camera itself, and the sound man, boo-hoo, cost around £850 a day. Here you go, you fleecing <laughs> Yeah, hope it chokes you. Then there's the rest of the production team to consider. We've got a series producer who keeps things all together, an assistant producer who assists him, two archive researchers who dig up old clips, another researcher who researches whatever it is that he does, uh, a runner who has to fetch me a coffee every time I clap my hands. Run! A production manager who balances the books, a production coordinator who coordinates shit, and this man who we pay to stand in a corner of the office feeding banknotes into a shredder. Not now! And then finally there's me, the talent. Amazingly, this lot costs around £1,900 a day. Here you go, you useless sponging f then there's the cost of post-production, i.e. an edit suite where we chop everything visual together and add filters like this or this. Make the picture do things like this or add graphics like this. Because that's the sort of thing you modern telly-watching whippersnappers demand nowadays. There's also an audio dub so we can add voiceovers and mix it all together properly so it doesn't sound rubbish like this. Next, there's clearance. Let's say I want to show you a clip from an old episode of <sighs> Clopper Castle. I say, I say, I say. What goes up when the rain comes down? I don't know. What does go up when the rain comes down? An umbrella. <laughs> well, that's copyrighted material, which has to be paid for. Unless, actually, you're showing it for the purposes of criticism and review, in which case you can often use it for nothing. Unfortunately, I'm not criticising or reviewing that at all, which means that old puppet nonsense has just cost the production £500. And it's not just moving images we have to pay for, simply by holding up this copyrighted photo of former Environment Secretary John Selwyn Gummer. I've cost the production another 50 quid. I don't even want to. Every time you see a photo like this in the background of a TV show, chances are someone has had to pay to clear it. And these are just the things you can see. Now, music. Actually, we save quite a lot of money here being on the BBC. Thanks to their blanket agreement with the music industry, there's a lot of tunes that don't cost us anything. If I was on another channel, it might cost me a fortune to play, say, a bit of Sergeant Pepper. But this is the Beeb, so take it away, the Beatles. Sergeant Pepper's 
Weirdly, however, I can't show you the cover of Sgt. Pepper because they won't let us. I can, however, just throw it away, thereby blowing another £15 on a prop. And if I'm pissing the money away, I might as well push the boat out even further with another great picture of John Selwyn Gummer. Ooh, we're partying now! There are loads of other costs which are on your screen now if you're that bothered. Anyway, given how much our modest half hour sets the world back, imagine how much it cost to make something like this. Oh, those are horses, those are notoriously expensive. They insist on being driven to the set every day in individual cars. Madness. Ah, that's a courtroom. They had to build that 10,000 times actual size, apparently. And that judge's wig, that's not a wig, that's a rare orchid. Yes, telly is a terrifyingly expensive business, so it's not surprising some shows try to claw back some of that cash any which way they can. Mm. 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 Way back in 1985, Live Aid viewers were shocked to pieces when Bob Geldof said, Give us your fucking money. Uh, terrible impersonation. And he'd never actually said that. What he actually said was this. There are people dying... Now, let's so give me the money, and here's the numbers. We'll let's read go them out. The way. I no, we're probably going to get the address let's just, first, aren't we? No, let's fuck the address. Let's get the numbers. <laughs> Noble sentiments there. Today, TV asks for your fucking money all the time. The only difference is the language has changed. A. Strawberries. Then you need to get on the phone. C. Oranges. Pick up the phone. Or C. Bananas. To eight double one four nine. It's exciting, ding, ding. Ah, yeah, no, there is one other difference. This time round, none of the money goes to the starving. Sorry, guys. Ah, uh, yeah, I think the answer is B. Beverly Allett. Premium rate phoning competitions have been a TV staple for years now, but recently there's been an explosion in the sheer amount of money grabbing that's going on. You've got reality show phone votes. If Jason's your winner, then vote for him on 0901 21 4404. You've got music stations running high tech versions of those playground games in which you used to work out whether somebody fancied you or not. This is a really good match for the two of you. Safe to say that's a match then. Then there's interactive muck. Call centres, basically, that you can masturbate to. Get that number, 0908 391 It's going to be below us throughout the whole show. Beep, beep, I done text it and a bum come out. Option number two is Chardonnay and option number three is Sarah. Her box looks like it's frozen. Her what looks like it's what? Those are aimed at idiotic men. For idiotic women, there's this sort of thing. Psychic predictions through your TV. Kerry up next says, uh, will I pass my driving test tomorrow? Oh, Kerry, yes, fingers sir. and toes crossed for you. Go slow now. Look at the cards there, yeah? Because the card for your driving test tomorrow shows you riding, a, you know, a horse. Modern day horse is obviously a car. Double seven, double seven. What are you waiting for? You're the psychic. You tell me. There are also dedicated quiz channels, which are the TV equivalent of round-the-clock coconut shies. It's exciting when you think you can walk away with £3,000 for one answer. And there are TV casinos where you can play roulette while the presenters struggle with moral dilemmas. I was actually thinking about joining the army. Yeah? Yeah, I yeah, really was. Be, what, you, mean, you know, going around... <laughs> yeah, doing the killing, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Still, at least that's vaguely real. Here's something that isn't. CGI race courses where you can bet real money on unreal GGs. Yes, come on, come on! Hey! The little horsey do go for a ride round Pixel Land. I suppose in today's kill or be killed, penny pinching business environment, this sort of thing is only to be expected. But I also can't help feeling it somehow permanently alters the relationship between viewer and box, and not for the better. After all, the TV was once the centrepiece of the suburban living room, a, a fount of shared experience for the whole nation. Whereas these days, it's often just a tawdry little slot machine that sits in the corner of your room and is hell-bent on guzzling the contents of your bank account through your phone. In many ways, this is the way it's always been. You've always been little more than a potentially exploitable blob of matter lurking somewhere out there in the dark. It's just not nice to be reminded of it in your own home. Now pay up, give me some money, go on, toss me a coin, reach forward and toss a f***ing coin through your screen right now. Give me some cash, you One way or another. 
guitar. Okay, every time I see this advert, it reminds me of Backstreet Abortions. You know how they used to perform them with coat hangers? It's this bit. Hang on. Overdone it this Christmas. Oh. Then why not try the special oh. cage? Now here's Look Around You's Robert Popper with something very dear to his heart. Every year there seems to be list programmes on TV counting down the worst programmes on television ever. There's one programme, to me, that should be at the top of this list that never is, because most people haven't seen it, and it's called Star Quality. Hello, my name's Giles Brandreth, and tonight, Lynn Gilbert, Joe Grossi, Billy Brightman and Rachel Collinson are all hoping to prove that they've got Star Quality. It has probably the most revolting title sequence with every colour ever known to man and others that are probably just known in the HTV region. The host of the show is Giles Brandreth, who is actually amazing. It's incredible what you can do in 60 seconds. He doesn't give anything away, but you can just tell that he's trying to think of what happens next in this unbelievably complicated mental game show. And throwing the dice and keeping the score is... Beguiling Beverly. This sort of quite large lady who doesn't have a surname in the credits, it's just Beverly. She's absolutely brilliant. And the only thing she really has to do is operate a calculator and press divide 11, which she's not very good at. It comes to 93. Okay. Split that up, find out how many lights Billy's got. Give him eight. There are four contestants from the HTV region. Tony Rudd, Liz Wilde, Peter Baxter... And Lisa Allison. They answer questions. One, two, two and then three, they move along four, the board. Five, I don't believe it. But if they land on an audition square, as Giles Brandreth uh, pronounced it, they get 60 seconds to present a, a piece of theatre, stand up comedy, uh, dancing, uh, playing the trombone. Well, I think you got the night. I think the funniest thing about when watching the programme, apart from it all being unbelievably bad and you're watching it like this, oh my god is you start thinking, how on earth did this ever get made? At what point did people say this is a good idea? You've now got 24 seconds to establish your true star quality. Good luck. It's not the pale moon that excites me. There's this fantastic part of the show where this poor woman is dragged out from the audience, has no idea she's going to be on the programme, and she's sort of forced onto stage, and she's given a microphone stand. And what you've got to do is turn it into as many different things as you can in 30 seconds. It really has to be seen to be believed. Motorbike. Uh, pneumatic drill. Umbrella. <laughs> Late, late. Um, <laughs> vacuum cleaner. One of my favourite parts of the series is, is one of the contestants called Billy Brightman, who looks exactly like a young Chris Morris. OK, what's it going to be? I'm going to do um, some acting, drama. A little bit of drama. Serious. Oh, good. Thespian Billy, it's audition time on star quality. And it is definitely the worst piece of acting I've ever seen, anyone's ever seen, and I think you'll ever see. I wasn't mentioned in the press. They didn't realise the important part that I played in Frank's life, so I didn't get the coverage. But I thought about re revealing myself. But what's the good? His fiancée had her photo taken, bawling her head off. She insisted we bury the engagement ring with him. It was just an, a, a theatrical gesture. It's too much trouble now to put a bunch of flowers on the grave. But his death was no accident. He was murdered. Don't contradict me! When I was making um, Look Around You... Hello, and welcome to Look Around You. Our first episode of the second series was really a mixture between Tomorrow's World and star quality. I'm rap, 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 rapping. I'm rapping all day and I'm rapping all night. Come on, I'm rapping to the beat and I rap... Welcome back. This is star quality. The whole show can probably be summed up by the actual star quality logo, which is a star with its points snipped off. Ten. 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 
Ten. Ten. Well, I give it ten. I don't like liars. Li- liars. I don't like cheats. Yeah, well, I don't like marzipan. You don't hear me banging on about it. Yes, The Apprentice is back, together with everyone's favourite blank-eyed grouch, Sir Alan Sugar, a man so grumpy he can probably turn milk sour just by staring at it. There is no phone in here. There is no text a number. There is no panel of judges that's going to make the decision up. This is not a game. No, I think you'll find it is a game, Sir Alan, which is presumably why this year's contestants all look and sound as though they've just stepped out of an Xbox beat-em-up. That's Saeed, bit robotic, but probably very good at swift, repetitive kicks to the head. Yep, that's your standard big guy who's going to be pretty good at wrestling. And that's Ansel, who can see through time. Actually, even their names fit the bill. Look, Ruth Badger wins. Paul Tulip wins. First series of The Apprentice was great fun because the contestants turned out to be a bunch of dongers who argued continually throughout each task. So, obviously, I was delighted to discover that the second series uh, has a bunch of contestants who are even bigger dongers, if that's possible, who argue before the tasks have even been set. Has anyone got a name at the moment? I have. Go for it. The A-Team. The A-Team? Yes. What else? Well, I had an idea of a team then called Jigsaw. Jigsaw. Because it's going to be made up of all different pieces, and each time you look at it, it's going to look different. Yeah, or what about pricks? Because that's what you are. It's early days so far, but some individuals are standing out, such as Saeed, the amazing robotic man, or Joe, who gets so excited she'd probably go, Woo, yeah, woo, hee-hoo-hoo, woo! <laughs> if you, I don't know, dipped a tea cosy in a bit of water in front of her. As ever, the teams are set a series of deceptively simple business tasks, which have to be carried out beneath the unremitting gaze of Sir Alan's representatives on Earth. Margaret Mountford and Nick Starey Hewer. They're like an eerie couple from a haunted painting, constantly hanging around in the background, observing things like ghosts. Nick Hewer in particular is a very hardcore scrutinizer. He he peers so hard all the time, he sort of constantly looks like he's trying to pick out individual atoms in the atmosphere at the end of his nose. Put him in a staring contest with Ansel and you've got a hell of a fight on your hands. Still, if Nick Hewer does look disapproving, it's hardly surprising since the tasks are designed to bring out the worst in absolutely everyone. Uh, the men, for instance, quickly transform themselves into dick-swinging business pricks. Guys, I'm trying to close the deal off here. Just give me one second. If I can close, I'll go for a close. While the women made a mockery of everything by pretty much getting their boobs out. These are very ripe and juicy. It's hardly Harvard Business School now, is it? Don't denigrate. What we did is about our credibility as like women in business, that we don't get labelled with a, a label that tells us that we have to do that to get money and to do business. Yeah, and bursting into tears in the boardroom is going to do a lot to further the image of women in business. Anyway, once again, The Apprentice looks like being the one reality show it's okay to admit to liking catchphrases and all. You're fired. (laughs) Ha ha. You're fired. (laughs) Hee hee. I love it when people... Ha, you're fired. Shut it. On next week's show, we'll be throwing up as TV slaps itself on the back. I can't think of anyone who better deserves this award than Jamie Oliver. Watching loads of people die on 24... And we'll be asking the question... Deal or no deal? Well...